So in this video, we're going to use free body diagrams to analyze the forces within the truss structure. So we're going to figure out what the forces are in each of the members of this truss. First, let's talk a little bit about how this thing is constructed. So at each node here, what we're assuming is that we have two members that essentially have a hole in it with a pin holding it together. So what this means is that the members are free to rotate, but they can't move apart from each other, right? So here, I just have two pieces of balsa wood with a thin pin uh, poked through it, so I can't pull them apart, but they are free to rotate. And so that's the assumption of how we build the truss structure. Now in reality, often you'll find in real structures, these parts might be welded together, there might be something like a steel plate holding them together, but generally we want the forces, uh, but generally uh, we want to think of it as just being held together by a pin joint. Now, if we imagine we take this thing apart, we have a pin and we have two members here, uh, each with a hole in it. So that's, we've just taken this thing apart. And so when we analyze the free body diagram, we're gonna think of what the forces are on each pin within this structure. So let's do an example. So let's imagine with this uh, structure here that I pull down in the center with a load P. Now, I haven't drawn it, but we have to obviously support this thing. So we're gonna support it at the two ends here and by symmetry, and from the last video, we learned that this would just be P over two, and P over two. So when we look at our isolate, this uh, left-hand uh, node, we have a reaction force, P over two, pushing on that. So the way we're going to analyze this is that we're going to imagine that there is a force, a P over two here, which is exerted on the pin. And so that means these two members need to exert a force on the pin as well. But since they're held together by a pin joint, we can't exert a moment, so this member can't exert a twist onto this pin, uh, nor can it exert a force in any direction but along the line of action. So it's just kind of like our string structure that all the forces are gonna be directed along the line of action. So in this case, I've drawn this uh, structure with 45 degrees here. And so at an angle of 45 degrees, I can have a force coming outward on the pin or inward on the pin. Now, since we know the sum of the forces is gonna to have to be equal to zero on the pin, we can see that this force is gonna be need to be directed inward on the pin because otherwise we don't have to compensate for the upward force of the reaction. And since now I have an X component going this way, this member is gonna to have to exert a force in that direction. Now, if we think about, well, what are the forces now on each of these members? If this force is on this pin, when I've taken this apart, Newton's laws is gonna tell us there has to be an equal and opposite reaction here. And so now there's a force exerted here going in that direction. So even though I sort of didn't draw a great diagram here with unequal sized arrows, this force and this force need to be exactly the same. So equal and opposite pair. So what that means is that this member here is going to be in compression. Now, if I come to this joint here, again, we're gonna have an equal and opposite pair. And so there's gonna be a force directed in this direction on this lower member here, which means this one is going to be in tension. So that's the basic uh, algorithm that we're gonna use to analyze these structures, is we'll just start at one known node uh, where we have reaction force, and we'll just kind of work our way across finding the forces at each location. So now let's do an example where we do exactly that. So now what I've done is exploded the structure. So I've pulled every member and every pin apart, and uh, I haven't drawn the whole thing due to size constraints here, but this is the midpoint. So really we only have to solve half this structure uh, due to symmetry. So if you remember, we're gonna consider the case where we had a load P here, and then a reaction force P over two here. Now we already did this joint, so we saw that this guy has to be exerting a force this direction, this one has to be exerting a force that direction, and so what this means is we need to have equal and opposite pair and an equal and opposite pair. And so we see that this is gonna be in compression and 
if this bar is going to be an equilibrium, that's going to have to also be an equal and opposite pair. So I'm going to shade this one blue for compression. And this bar down here, in order to be an equilibrium, is going to have to have an equal and opposite pair acting there. And I'm going to shade this one red for tension. So now let's go and figure out what these forces actually are, which we can kind of do by inspection. And now remember, we're considering the case here where each of these is 45 degrees. So that makes our uh, algebra a little bit simpler because if I have sine or cosine, it's always going to be a factor of square root of 2. So if I think about it, this vector here is the only one with a downward component. And so when I take the magnitude of this vector and I take the sine of 45 degrees, it has to be p over 2. So you can check this yourself, but I'm doing this quickly by inspection. So this is going to be the same force p over 2, but multiplied by the square root of 2, right? So when I take this value times the sine of 45 degrees, I get p over 2. But since it's 45 degrees and the sine and the cosine is also 1 over root 2, then that means the horizontal component of this vector has to match the horizontal component of that vector, which means the magnitude of the tension here is p over 2. So I know I'm doing this quickly, but it's up to you to go back and make sure that you can uh, do these yourself. OK, so now uh, let's see. So which joint should we move to next? Let's do this one. So we have an equal and opposite pair here. So that needs to be p over 2. Um, we're not sure what's going on there. So let, actually, let me go up to this joint. So this kind of tells you sometimes you have to iterate a little bit here. So I need to have an equal and opposite pair here, which means this one needs to be acting uh, with that exact same magnitude. And if I look, since there's only a vertical component here and a vertical component here, those two vectors need to be exactly the same. So what does that mean? It means I have an equal and opposite pair here. This one is in tension and the value is exactly the same as this member here because those two forces have to be in equilibrium. So p over 2 times root 2. So now that gives me the force there, um, which I need to add in that direction. So now I know these two forces. Now we have to figure out what those are going to be. Uh, but let's finish our node up here. Since I have um, these two vectors are both pointing, their x component is pointing to the left. That means this one needs to be adding the x component to the right. And again, since th these both have this factor of root 2 here, when I take the cosine of 45 degrees, I just get p over 2 back. And what does that mean? It means this one has to be in compression, and its magnitude is p. Now remember, I've done this a bunch of times, and I know the solution ahead of time. So that allows me very quickly to go here and uh, figure out what these forces are. You should do this a little bit more systematically and carefully and make sure that you kind of confirm my answer. Now again, I only have a vertical component here and a vertical component here. For, so for this little pin to be in equilibrium, this member here has to be exerting a downward force, which has to be exactly matching that one. So again, just like here where those have to be equal, these have to be equal, meaning again, the force exerted on the member, equal and opposite, and again, the same magnitude, so p over 2 root 2 compression. Now we see the x component of these three vectors are all pointing to the left, meaning the force here has to be pointed to the right, which means the force on the member is now in tension. And we can figure out what that force is uh, quite easily, because I have a left component of p over 2. Each of these, the magnitude is p over 2 times root 2, 
when I take the x component, the root two cancels out, so I have three counts of p over two, p over two, p over two, p over two. So this one is three halves p. Now we're getting there, we're almost done. So I think you kind of get the pattern of these vertical components, right? Because I have this one acting here. The only way that vertical component can be counterbalanced is if the arrows point like that. This also has to have an equal and opposite pair. So that's exerting a force P. Each of those exerting a force P over two root two. Um, and so now since we have the X component of all these acting to the left, this has to be acting uh, to the right. Again, you should check that uh, you believe me, but I've got P to the left. These two here are also contributing uh, P. So this is gonna be in compression, 2P. Now again, we've just gone at this point up to the halfway point, but I think you can start to see the pattern that the internal uh, members that go up and down alternate tension compression, all with the same magnitude. The lower part is all in tension, the upper part is all in compression, and the magnitude of the forces kind of increases as you come towards the center. So let's come back to our original drawing now and summarize the results. So the upper bar is all in compression, so I'm gonna color code that blue. This has a load of P, 2P, and P. The lower, every one of those bars is going to be in tension. This one is going to have a load of P over 2, 3P over 2, and by symmetry, the same thing. Now the internal structures are going to alternate tension and compression. So we're gonna have something like that. And the magnitude of every one on the internal one is P over two root two. And again, my angle here is 45 degrees. And so that's the basic structure. So uh, we see that was quite easy to do. Um, takes a little bit of time to work your way through it, but you have to be a little bit uh, systematic. And you should probably the first time you do this be a lot more careful than I was, rather than just going to each node and kind of guessing what the answer is. And then the other important thing to recognize here is that whenever we see trusses, we always see triangles. Here's a little model that I've made a square and a triangle made with pin joints and balsa wood. So we can see that since those pins can rotate, when I have four members, the structure is not constrained, but when I have three, there is. So this is nice and stable, this one is not. So this is why when we see truss structures, we see lots and lots of triangles.